last lecture for today is about collapse theories. Uh, that means theories of spontaneous collapse of the wave function, that is, collapse not triggered by measurements done by observers. The simplest such theory and the best known one oh my God, is due to Girardi, Rimini, and Weber, uh, ideally abbreviated GRW theory. People who also published on this approach just mention a few names, Philip Pearl, Angela Bassi, Nicholas Vizan, Robert Penrose, Anthony Leggett, Stephen Weinberg. Uh, I was Joseph. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, I, I should have mentioned GOG as well. So, um, now somehow I can't see the full title. Spontaneous collapse, I think it is. Uh, whatever. <clears throat> so here's the key idea. The Schrödinger equation, according to this approach, is not strictly correct. It's only an approximation that's valid for systems with few particles. For example, it's uh, what we would expect. It's uh, an excellent approximation if you have uh, less than 10,000 particles, but not for macroscopic systems with, let's say, 10 to the 23 particles. The true evolution law for the wave function is nonlinear and stochastic. So with the idea being that stochastic evolution means it's inherently random, uh, that just uh, nature makes random decisions about uh, how the um, um, how the, the wave function evolves next. Um, and the uh, uh, um, the idea is to design the evolution in such a way that it avoids superpositions such as Schrodinger's cat of macroscopic and different contributions. Um, but differently, a key idea here is to regard the collapse of the wave function as a physical process governed by mathematical laws and to write down explicit models for how, these, how this uh, uh, process could take place. Explicit equations for that were um, first suggested by Girardi, Rumini, and Weber in 1986. Um, and, uh, uh, and they could have actually set up a model in such a way that the predictions of the theory deviate very, very slightly from the quantum formalism. I will explain why they deviate from the standard predictions of quantum mechanics. <coughs> uh, but they found a way of um, making this deviation so small that even today it's not possible to set up an experimental test. Although, um, Experimentalists are working on that, trying to get closer to testing uh, the GW theory against quantum mechanics. I will give some further information uh, about that um, on another slide. <clears throat> so here is the, uh, the stochastic process for the wave function. So the wave function evolves in a uh, stochastic way, so this evolution, of, uh, and a stochastic evolution that's called a stochastic process. Uh, so this is designed, now the version that I would describe is designed for non-relativistic quantum mechanics of many particles. It's meant to replace the Schrödinger equation as the fundamental law of nature. So <clears throat> in, uh, uh, in this theory we think of uh, the, uh, the, the stochastic evolution that I'm about to um, describe as one of the fundamental laws of nature. Uh, this. Um, this setup involves new two new constants, or kind of parameters of the theory. So you could say that the GRW theory is actually a two-parameter family of theories. Um, and the two parameters, which, which in a world governed by this theory will actually have the status of constants of nature, are called the collapse rate per particle and the collapse width. And GRW have proposed kind of order of magnitude values for these constants uh, chosen in such a way that the predictions of the theory will be close to those of standard quantum mechanics. Okay, I'll come back to that later. So here's the definition of this stochastic evolution. The wave function evolves with time as if an observer outside the universe made at random times with the rate n lambda quantum measurements of the position observable of a randomly selected particle with inaccuracy sigma. Let me explain that a bit. <clears throat> OK, um, so if somebody outside the universe um, made um, 
um, measurements are the universe. That means between these measurements, um, the wave function just evolves according to Schrodinger's equation, unitarily, and then at random times, this outside observer, let's say, chooses, um, well, it chooses random times. These random times occur with rate n lambda. That means that the probability of an event, a collapse, occurring in the next dt seconds is equal to n lambda dt. So lambda is this constant, n, the number of particles, dt, the uh, length of the time interval. As a consequence of that, the, the distribution of the um, uh, the, the probability distribution of the waiting time until the next event is an exponential distribution. So if, it, um, if uh, an event has not occurred yet, that's the probability for the, uh, for the event in the next uh, dt. And um, then once an event occurs, you, you start this, uh, this exponential waiting um, uh, again you have a, another um, exponential waiting time for the next collapse. Uh, it, yes, please. It depends. I, I saw this every particle does so. Um, yeah, so uh, people <coughs> discussed about different versions of the theory, whether you should make it depend on the mass. Is, is that what you want to talk about? Whether lambda depends but on the mass? I understand now you say you have n particles, they wait until they collapse, like this collapse and then they start again. I saw that every particle may collapse independently. Uh, yes, you, you can look at it in different ways. So, uh, so you can say a collapse occurs um, after, <coughs> um, after a waiting time that has rate n lambda. Higher rate may, means more frequent collapses. You could also think of, uh, um, well, at a collapse, you but uh, kind of there's a standard theory that says that every particle collapses randomly, whatever. Now, your theory is extremely complicated. It should look, all particles look on each other and wait until one will collapse and then will change. No, no, it's just mathematical equivalent uh, descriptions. So the way I describe it here on the slide is, <coughs> uh, suppose this outside person does the, these measurements, then uh, this person will wait, uh, uh, a waiting time, a random waiting time, and uh, the rate is n times now. Okay, what I'm saying here is psi evolves as if an observer outside of the universe did this. Now, uh, in, the, in the rules of quantum mechanics, uh, we know what it means for an observer uh, uh, to, to do an ideal quantum measurement on a certain system with wave function in a particular Hilbert space. So now, the whole universe, the wave function here, the wave function of the whole universe, the Hilbert space is the Hilbert space of the whole universe, and now, uh, the, what this uh, description means is apply this, uh, the usual rules for ideal quantum measurements, now you uh, apply it to the wave function of the universe. Okay, that's what I mean by as if. Good. Uh, sorry, but it, so if he measures, he can find it. Okay, not fine. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Let, let me finish and then, okay, then I think your, uh, your concern will have been addressed. Okay. So, um, now let's say this outside observer makes a quantum measurement of the position. He selects randomly a particular particle. So there, um, there are n particles. Select one randomly. On this particle, you make a, a position measurement. But it's not a sharp position measurement. It's a position measurement with a certain inaccuracy signal. Uh, that means the following. <coughs> if you did a sharp position measurement, you would have to collapse to an eigenstate of position, to a delta function in that variable. We don't do that. Uh, we have an unsharp position measurement. So we have here a Gaussian. We multiply by a Gaussian factor that has a certain width sigma. So this is the constant sigma from before. That's the width of this Gaussian. OK. Now, <coughs> uh, if, uh, so here. Uh, this is the equation for the collapse, so this, let's see, maybe I can remove this pointer on seven one. Okay. Uh, so this is the wave function before the collapse, and this is the wave function after the collapse, and multiply with this Gaussian, which is kind of narrow, 10 to the minus 7 meters. Okay, now the, <coughs> uh, and the, the Gaussian, it's a Gaussian function in the variable qk, 
and the center of the Gaussian is a certain point Q. This point Q has been chosen randomly, and here's the probability distribution. It's some expression uh, that actually means it's a psi square distribution with the wave function of psi before the collapse, and then convolved with the Gaussian, which means smeared out with the Gaussian, so you actually blur it a little bit. Okay, on this small scale, you blur it a little bit. But this is a, a mathematically equivalent way of writing it. Good. Now, um, uh, so mathematically, in the, in the theory of, uh, <coughs> of the of stochastic processes, you could either say, oh, I have, um, I have a process that, that has events occurring at a rate n lambda, and then whenever a, an event occurs, I choose one of the n particles at random. Or equivalently, you could say, oh, I have kind of, uh, I have n alarm clocks, each of which is independent, in each of which uh, clocks uh, um, uh, rings at a random time, and it has rate lambda. And if the, uh, the i alarm clock rings, then I carry out a measurement of particle number i. Does that address your question? Yes. Okay. Uh, First one question, what is this k or this q k? Is it just the argument? Uh, yeah, the, the k is the number of the particle. Uh, okay. Uh, so the, the psi here is an n particle wave function. So q1 through qn are n variables in R3. So we were talking about the k particle. You choose the k randomly. Every particle is equally likely. And then uh, sometimes people say, oh, we, we make these, these rates different. We make them mass dependent, so heavier particles have, uh, uh, get, uh, get hit by collapses more frequently than lighter particles. So this will um, yeah, actually make it easier to, um, to, to have the theory agree with the standard uh, empirical observations. Okay. Uh, yes, so the wave function that collapses, is that for the particle and everything it has got it entangled with? Yes, so what's happening here is we take this function, we multiply by this Gaussian. I have a picture of that that we're showing on the next slide. So here's an example, a wave function before and after. So this plane here is the configuration space of two particles in one dimension. Uh, so I'm representing wave functions as functions on configuration space. They're complex value. I'm just showing you the real part. So let's say here is uh, some wave function before the collapse, some complicated wave function. Now comes the collapse. What happens? I choose one of the particles randomly. Uh, let's say uh, one particle corresponds to this axis, the other particle to that. I choose that axis. On that axis, <coughs> I multiply by a Gaussian. Okay, if you look at along that axis, you see the Gaussian here, okay? So in this variable, we've multiplied by a Gaussian. In that variable, uh, the, the factor didn't depend on that variable. We leave everything unchanged. So since the, uh, since the wave function was um, oscillating in that variable, it stays oscillating in that variable, but we narrowed it down into one variable, QK. Um, and now here, the, the constant sigma, you can see that in the picture, that's the width of this Gaussian. Uh, now this, this kind of stochastic evolution, that uh, it looks as follows in Hilbert space, you have uh, a piecewise deterministic stochastic jump process. So it means that in Hilbert space, so now imagine here we have Hilbert space, now here we have uh, a point that's a wave function. So for a while it evolves unitarily. So it just uh, rotates around the origin. Okay, then at some random time it will jump to a different point in, uh, in Hilbert space, a different point of the unit sphere. And there again it will uh, start rotating until some, some random time when it jumps again. Okay, so it's piecewise deterministic in the sense that uh, if you know what the, what the two times are, then in between uh, everything is deterministic because it's unitary. <coughs> Overall, it's stochastic because in two ways, the times of the jumps are stochastic and where you jump is stochastic. Uh, let's see. Um, now, the, the rate of jumps 
is n lambda, and that means that the average time between the two jumps is 1 over n lambda. Um, so um, for a single particle, you, you see the, the value of this constant lambda. Let me go back to the slides. The value was 10 to the minus 16, small number of hertz. Okay, so that means you have um, one jump every 10 to the 16 seconds. Oh, welcome, John. Uh, yes, please. How is number per fixed? Just lambda? Okay, so uh, the situation is uh, that GRW, who proposed this theory, uh, uh, proposed these values or orders of magnitude for these, uh, uh, for these constants. Uh, and um, uh, and if there were empirical evidence for uh, for GFW theory, then from these uh, empirical facts, uh, you should be able to um, uh, to figure out what actually the values of these constants are. So at this point, these values are just kind of fantasy. They're values for which the theory would work well. Okay, so that's kind of part of the proposal. Yes, yeah, so it's allowed. Is lambda related to the Poisson distribution? Yes. Uh, so uh, this, um, uh, the times of the collapses form what is known as a Poisson process, uh, which is a Poisson process means the bottom, here you have the time axis. Poisson process means uh, you have several random times and always the waiting times between them are independent and exponentially distributed. So here, the times of the collapses form a Poisson process, and um, um, yes, I think, does that answer your question? Good. John? Because I was thinking of that, maybe to answer a question which we should say that all these parameters and the fact that it's Poisson and it's Gauche and so on, I mean, this is just invented for simplicity, but there is no evidence for that. Yes, the, the, the process, because there is no evidence that there is any devi deviation from quantum mechanics. So the process could be non Gaussian, it could be correlated, it could be all kinds of things, no? Yes, that is right. So, so I'm, what I'm, so I'm, so I'm describing here is just one particular specific concrete model that, yeah. uh, that people can then analyze. You can ask what are exactly sure, the sure, sure. Of that. But yeah. people might be confused to worry mm -hmm. why these things are actually taken. They're just a model. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's not a Okay. So for a single particle, you will have one collapse every 100 million years. So then it's obvious why you don't observe collapses on a single particle. For 10,000 particle, particles, you will have one collapse every 10,000 years. You still don't see that. For 10 to the 23 particles, a microscopic object, you have one collapse every 10 to the minus 7 seconds. So that should happen all the time. So that's uh, part of the idea here, that, uh, um, that collapses will uh, occur on macroscopic objects, but not on microscopic ones. Now, for this um, um, for this process, one can um, one can prove various theorems about its properties, such as the no signaling theorem, um, which roughly says that if you two if you have two sets of particles which don't interact, mm -hmm. then any any external fields that you apply to one set will not affect actually the collapses on the other set. Good. Now, I'd like to explain how GW theory solved the measurement problem. <clears throat> okay, again, I'm depicting wave functions as functions on configuration space. So here I'm drawing configuration space. Of course, configuration space has three n dimensions. I'm drawing just two of them. So here's one of the dimensions, let's say for one particle, and here's some other, some other variable. And uh, let's say, for a, in, the, in the measurement problem, you talk about a quantum measurement. You have an object and an apparatus, let's say a particle and a detector. Uh, and let's say this is the, the position of the particle, and this is some variable of the detector that maybe represents uh, the pointer position or something. OK, so we have a wave function 
that um, uh, evolved in some way as to form a, a superposition, for example, now this could be in the standard galaxy experiment, for example. Now the interaction with the apparatus starts, uh, so the, uh, the particle gets entangled with the apparatus. Oh, maybe I should explain here what these, uh, what these circles actually mean. So in order to represent uh, a function in configuration space, since it's relevant that this function is basically zero in most places, and we have packets that are just uh, significantly non-zero only in certain regions, basically what I'm drawing here is just the support of the function. Uh, by support, uh, well, the strict meaning of the word support is the set where the function is non-zero. Here, let me say, the set where the function is significantly non-zero. So we have like two wave packets, they're significantly non-zero in these two regions, and outside, it's basically zero. Good. So we arrive in a situation where we have, where the total wave function, the wave function of the universe, or the wave function of just this composite system, particle detector, has this form. Uh, it's entangled because it doesn't factorize this thing, because you have, well, each of these wave packets may factorize it, but since you have two of them, and they're not like this, and you don't have four, it, it doesn't factorize. Okay, so you have the entanglement between the, um, between the uh, system and the apparatus, between the particle and the detector. Now, <clears throat> what happens? Uh, you see, for the particle, there's one collapse every 100 million years, but for the detector, there's one collapse every 10 to the minus 7 seconds. So within 10 to the minus 7 seconds, one of the detector particles let's say one of the particles perhaps in the, in the pointer will, will be hit by a collapse. So that means that we will multiply the wave function by a Gaussian, which is concentrated uh, essentially in some, uh, in some strip here, some horizontal strip. That is uh, because it depends only on this variable, not on the other variable. Okay, so let's say you by multiplying by this Gaussian here, function of this variable, you will essentially set the wave function to zero outside of this horizontal strip. That is, you will set the wave function down here to zero. That is the consequence of this, of this collapse. So that means as soon as a collapse occurs for one particle in the apparatus, the superposition, the whole superposition, will break down. That's because there's only one wave function for particle and apparatus together. And the entanglement uh, leads to the situation that then the, um, the collapse for the, uh, for the apparatus also leads uh, to uh, a collapse for the, for the particle in the sense that previously there were two contributions for the particle, and now there's only one contribution for the particle. Okay, so that is how it works. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, please. Is it that uh, after multiplying by the Gaussian, the the state of the other particle has just disappeared, disappeared or like? Ah, okay. It's, I, I think it's it's dangerous to say the state of the particle because in the end there's just one wave function and it's a wave function of all particles together, the the one particle and all the detector particles. Um, uh, uh, so the wave function, the the bottom wave function. Yes. Uh, okay. Of these wave, two wave packets, yes. one has disappeared. How did that happen? Oh, that was the wave function before the collapse, and before, before the jump. Then uh, a jump occurred in the good space. This jump corresponds to multiplying by a Gaussian. That is, you multiply here. You set everything outside equal to zero, essentially. And that's how then this, uh, this packet disappears. You had two packets in configuration space before. Just one packet is left afterwards. Now, this might be a kind of stupid question, but how would this picture work if we put the second wave packet of the particle also on top where the gas Also on top of here? Yeah. yeah, then that would remain. It would not disappear. Okay. Yeah, so for example, if instead of these two packets, you had four packets here, then these two packets down here would disappear, and these two packets up there would stay. Okay. So that would occur, for example, if, uh, if they were disentangled, if there was no entanglement between the detector and the and the part. Yes. Um,
Now, so the, the result here is that a macroscopic superposition, such as Schrodinger's cat, would collapse away, decay within 10 to the minus 7 seconds. In fact, uh, uh, well, the, uh, the, the time it takes for, for these wave packs to separate is usually longer than 10 to the minus 7 seconds. So uh, um, you usually don't even get into the situation where you have two clearly separated, macroscopically separated wave packets. <coughs> anyway, let's just, if we just consider a wave function such as Schrodinger's cat, in, um, uh, which has two wave packets in configuration space, which are in macroscopically different regions. So they are like the, these two wave packets here. Then um, uh, quickly uh, a collapse would occur, and this collapse would, after tails of the Gaussian, um, remove all of the wave packets except for one. Um, uh, now, which one? That will be chosen randomly because the collapse, the, the center of the Gaussian is chosen randomly, and uh, this, this probability distribution is such a, in such, done in such a way that uh, the probability is up to small errors given by the magnitude of uh, the corresponding wave packet. So mathematically, the norm square of that wave packet. That's basically the reason why GW agrees <coughs> with the standard quantum predictions to an accident degree of approximation. But in practice, it, I don't know, I should say, in principle, in principle, the predictions of GW theory can differ from standard quantum mechanics. Here's a trivial example of that. Uh, consider a double slit experiment in which uh, the, 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 the screen is very far away from the double slit and it takes the particle 300 million years to travel from the double slit to the screen then uh, you wouldn't see any interference pattern on the screen. Here's why. So after the double slit, you have this, uh, uh, the two contributions. <coughs> and uh, let's say you have some, some superposition. Then during these 300 million years, it's overwhelmingly likely that a collapse occurs. And then, um, uh, then you, don't, you don't get the interference. Let's what say here. The, uh, what if we are doing it in uh, absolute vacuum? Yes, yes. So just for the, uh, for the purpose of having a theoretical example of something where, where GW theory clearly deviates from standard quantum mechanics. Uh, maybe I didn't formulate it very well, so you, you, I guess you should have these wave packets separated and only at the end you would try to, uh, to make them overlap to see the interference. And that would not be possible if in the meantime one of the wave packets had disappeared spontaneously. Uh, okay, now since for this kind of experiment you would have to wait for a very long time, this is not a practical way to test GW theory against standard quantum mechanics. So it's a kind of non trivial question how you can actually test this theory against standard quantum mechanics. All right, here are two effects that, uh, that actually play a role for this kind of test. <coughs> um, one is, oh, if you chose for um, sigma, the width of the Gaussian, a value much smaller than 10 to the minus 7 inches, something really narrow, then what would happen is that uh, when, when you have a collapse, so you multiply your wave function by a really narrow Gaussian, then your wave function becomes really narrow in position, which means by virtue of Heisenberg's uncertainty relation that it has to become really wide in momentum. If it becomes really wide in momentum, there is non-trivial, um, there is substantial probability for very high values of energy or momentum. So these collapses tend to increase the energy of wave packets. So these jumps tend to lead to uh, wave functions of higher energy. So that's actually the reason why you don't want to make this value of sigma too small. You don't want to use delta functions, which would be kind of the ideal position measurement. <coughs> you want to have it wide enough. That's why they come up, came up with something like 10 to the minus 7 meters. Uh, yeah, we'll do the calculation in, in one of the exercise problems. <coughs> um, but um, so now, even for this 10 to the minus 7 meters, you still see some, some shadows of this phenomenon. Uh, you can still see a slight energy increase, and that is 
for example, one prediction that deviates from, um, from standard quantum mechanics and a possible way of empirically testing GOW theory against quantum mechanics. GOW theory predicts that things will spontaneously get warmer and warmer over time. <coughs> There's universal warming in the GOW theory. Okay, uh, here's a picture about the concerning the, uh, the empirical adequacy of GRW theory. <clears throat> so here, let's focus on this picture, the first one for the moment. Uh, since there's a two-parameter family of theories, parameterized by sigma and lambda, uh, every point here in this parameter plane um, corresponds to a different version of GRW theory. So here you see these 10 to the minus 7 meters and 10 to the minus 16 hertz. So these are the values, the fantasy <coughs> values that were suggested by GW. <coughs> now, um, for, for each version of the theory, um, you could ask, um, if, I, if I consider all the empirical facts we know, all the, uh, all the experiments that have already been done with the accuracy to which they have confirmed quantum mechanics, Will that exclude my version of the GW theory? And the answer is, for some values of your parameters, yes, and for other values, no. And this will, in this way, a certain region in this parameter plane will be excluded. Uh, I call that the empirically refuted region. So any point in this region here, in this shaded region, corresponds to a version of GW theory that has already been empirically refuted. So for example, this happens for, um, for very small values of sigma because I've already told you, if you choose very small values of sigma, then you get a big energy increase. And at some point, we should be able to see this kind of energy increase. And we don't see it. So that puts bounds on how small the, the value of sigma could be. So that excludes a certain region here of the parameter plane. Now, as you do more and more experiments, better and better ones, this boundary of the region tends to move in a, in a, in a southwest direction. Uh, and um, so then um, it will exclude more and more possible parameter values. And maybe one day it will actually exclude the GRW values. And maybe one day this whole island here will have uh, melted away. Um, what is this other region? I call this the, the philosophically unsatisfactory region. So that is a, a region in which the, the GRW theory um, doesn't actually manage to do what it is supposed to do, namely to get rid of macroscopic uh, superpositions. OK. so. The details are a different discussion. OK, so there is some region in which uh, you, uh, you wouldn't find a GRW theory satisfactory. <coughs> and uh, there is only a certain region in between that is still possible, and this region is shrinking. So and perhaps one day, it will have, uh, the, the region will have gone altogether, and then we will have refuted GRW theory. At least in this particular version, I've drawn here the diagram for different versions of, uh, of collapse theories, and you see they look a little different. Um, now, when you when you hear that um, GRW theory <coughs> um, uh, reproduces the predictions of quantum mechanics, then you should probably be shocked. Uh, you should say, didn't Bohr tell us that this was impossible? And the answer is, yes, he told us, and he was wrong. And you should say, uh, how can it be possible that non-commuting operators as observables arise in contradiction-free theory? Uh, what isn't it the case that non-commutativity of the observable somehow prove the impossible, impossibility of any coherent theory? a uh, single theory that explains all the phenomena? <coughs> and the answer is no. So we have seen in these slides, uh, when, when I discussed the measurement problem, how GFW theory reproduces the prediction of quantum mechanics. 
And, well, specifically, uh, uh, when you ask the question, how can non-commutative operators arise? <coughs> yeah, there's a little uh, calculation where I can actually see this happen. The distribution of the collapse center Q. It's given by this formula. Uh, and if you do some math and express it in terms of the initial wave function, you see, okay, it's that uh, kind of quantum average of a particular operator. And that depends on the time when the collapse occurs. And for different values of that time, these operators will not commute with each other. So basically, the non-commutativity comes up here in these formulas. And it basically comes from the fact that these time evolution operators for the unitary part of the time evolution don't commute with these Gaussian multiplication operators, functions of the position operators. So the, the time evolution does not commute position operators, that's uh, ultimately the origin, how in this theory you get non-commutative operators. Uh, okay, now, um, can I, uh, let's see. Now the title, uh, um, I could have used the title. The title is, I think, the word ontology. So this slide, is about the word ontology. Okay, so um, uh, in, in the following, I will talk about ontology. Uh, although it's a, I would say it's a physics talk, and uh, it, it sounds well. Many physicists would uh, kind of um, uh, they, they wouldn't talk about ontology when they talk about physics. So um, it's perhaps necessary that I um, that I give some explanation why this word ontology is not as bad as it may sound at first. It sounds very philosophical. It sounds that it, we're getting into uh, discussions of, uh, of uh, paranormal things or whatever, <clears throat> but we're not. Uh, so for example, uh, you can, uh, uh, to calm you down, you see ontology is actually a technical term in computer science, and it, uh, computer scientists can can live with that as a technical term. We can also do that in physics. It is actually a technical term in the foundation of quantum mechanics. What does it mean? It means what exists in the world according to the theory. So for example, in Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, uh, by this I mean a classical theory of endpoint particles. So endpoint particles move around in three-dimensional Euclidean space. So the ontology, is uh, what, what Newtonian mechanics says the world consists of. So let's say, uh, in the particular version of Newtonian mechanics that I want to talk about here, let's say it says, oh, there's a three-dimensional Euclidean space, and uh, the, um, in the course of time, point particles, material points move around in the space. Okay, let's say time then is kind of a, a Euclidean one-dimensional space, if you wish, and you have these particles uh, which move around in the, uh, in the space. Um, uh, now, if Jean had been here earlier, he, he would have already told you about Bohmian mechanics. Uh, so I can already give away that the, the, the ontology of Bohmian mechanics is, is, the, is, is a similar thing. You have a Euclidean space, you have a one dimensional time axis, you have these particles, and in addition to that, you have a wave function psi. So these are the things that exist according to this theory. Okay, so that's what the word ontology means. <coughs> um, now, in physics, it was long thought that the key to clarity in quantum mechanics was to avoid talking about ontology. Uh, remember that, uh, according to, uh, to Copenhagen, there are all these pictures that you can make, but uh, in the end, you can't take any of these pictures seriously. None of these pictures actually um, <coughs> is consistent with the, uh, with the empirical facts. Um, so it was thought that um, the, these pictures, um, uh, you, you shouldn't use them, um, or at least not take them seriously. So you shouldn't talk about uh, ontology. What you should do instead is talk about, if I do a certain operation, then I get a particular result. Operational statements. Uh, I would say that thought has not paid off. On the contrary, actually trying to find some coherent ontology, trying to find a particular picture that fits all the experiments of quantum mechanics, that was the key to success. 
Um, now this slide is about the word beables. Uh, this word was invented by John Bell <coughs> as kind of uh, opposite of observables. Uh, beables uh, are the variables in a theory that represent the ontology, the things that actually exist. Hence the name. <clears throat> the quantities that actually have values in contrast to observables, which don't really have, quant uh, have values. We, we uh, talk about observables as if they were quantities. We call them names such as quantities. But of course, they don't actually have values. They are not actually quantities. So in a theory, then, what are the things that actually are quantities, the variables that have values? OK, those things, they'll call them variables. <clears throat> Um, um, perhaps one more comment on the, on the word beables, <coughs> uh, because able is kind of means something like could be. Uh, there is a kind of tentative character to this word um, um, because what the beables are depends on the theory. Different theories have different pictures of what is real in the world, so it depends on the theory what the beables are. Now, this slide is about another word, primitive ontology. OK, so people also talk about primitive ontology. Let me explain what is meant by that. The primitive ontology of a theory is the part of the ontology that represents matter in three-dimensional space or in four-dimensional space-time. For example, in Bohmian mechanics, the ontology consists of well, Euclidean space and so on, the particles and the wave function. The primitive ontology consists of the particles. Uh, where in Bohmian mechanics do you find the tables, as Lev said, in the particles, <coughs> not in the wave function. So in many worlds, you would look at the wave function to uh, find the tables, but in Bohmian mechanics, you should look at the particles. Good. Now I think that for GOW theory to make sense, it also needs a primitive ontology. So I will outline two proposals for a possible primitive ontology for GOW theory. And then I will make some comments about um, why that is relevant to have a primitive ontology. The first proposal is called the flash ontology. That means the following. Uh, this is a space-time diagram. And what you see in the space-time diagram, maybe you can't see it clearly, is a lot of points. There is like a, a few thousand points here in this space-time diagram. Mm -hmm. These points are called the flashes. Instead of particle world lines, you see if you have particles, then in space time you, they have world lines, curves in space time. They correspond to particles. Now, the idea of the flash ontology is that instead of world lines, you have world points. So, with world lines, you have kind of matter is concentrated on these curves. You have material points moving in space, that means material curves are in space time. And now, in the flash ontology, you have material points in space time, world points. OK, that is kind of an uh, unusual idea to have that, but we can understand the meaning. So we could have this, this pattern, this set of thousands of flashes. <coughs> and uh, now you can imagine that they form some kind of, uh, well, Bell called that a galaxy, some kind of shape. You can imagine why a, a macroscopic object, the shape of a macroscopic object, could come out of this set of flashes. So for example, here, this is like uh, like this, the shape. So it's like a double star. It's like two balls circling each other. And each one has a certain uh, number of flashes per second. That's the flash ontology. Um, then the other ontology that I want to talk about is the matter density ontology. OK, let's first talk about the particle ontology. So that's the usual thing that you have in classical mechanics that you have in Bohemian. OK, here's the space-time diagram. You have world lines. Here's the space diagram, snapshot at one particular uh, time. You have finally many points. They form a table. Wonderful. Now, <clears throat> that's the particle ontology. Now, let's have a look at the matter density ontology. There, we say that matter is continuously distributed in three-dimensional space or four-dimensional space-time. So here is what the space-time diagram looks like. Oh, it's some, uh, yeah, there, there's some density function that tells you what the density of matter is at every space-time point. Um, now, uh, if you take a snapshot of that at a particular time, 
then you see uh, kind of some uh, uh, some pattern in, in space um, representing the distribution of matter, and that could have uh, particular shapes such as a table. Okay. Both so the shapes are same. Both the shapes are same. The table and the um, you mean that these two yeah. pictures yes. uh, should correspond to each other? No, uh, no. This uh, um, I just try to draw some uh, some non-trivial continuous function. Sorry. Yes. So I see how the meta density ontology corresponds to GRW because you have the, the you have always the continuous wave function. I actually I'm told you yet how okay. it corresponds to, but, but I think it, you it know seems okay. it seems plausible. Yes. But, okay, so, so you will tell how the yes, yes, that will be yes, the next sorry. slide. Okay. The next slide has the laws for the primitive ontology. So that will define how, if I know what the <coughs> what the, the stochastic wave function is, um, how what, what the flashes and the, the map density function are. So there are two different theories. One theory is the GRW theory with flash ontology. A separate theory is the GRW theory with map density ontology. But you use the same wave function for in one case, um, you put a flash at every collapse of the wave function. So if the wave function collapses at a time t, since q, at that space time point, you put a flash. Uh, so that means in a microscopic object, you said there will be uh, what uh, 10 to the 7 um, collapses per second. So you will have 10 to the 7 flashes per second. So <coughs> the, the, the table then corresponds uh, to just a finite number of space-time points and flashes, but that is enough to define the shape of the table. Uh, in this uh, competitive theory, you claim that matter is continuously distributed with this uh, density function. Let me explain why this formula for the density function it means the following. You take the wave function. Psi squared gives you a particular density function in three dimensions. Now you take the three-dimensional marginal of this three-n-dimensional density, uh, which can be expressed by saying uh, you, um, you integrate out n minus one of the variables, or this is written here by integrating over all n, but having a delta function that will <coughs> kind of keep you one of the variables under a different name. And then, um, since you have to, have to choose which particle, yeah, maybe you want to average over all particles, uh, you could make it a, a weighted average, and then maybe the, the masses of the particles are natural choices of the weights for this weighted average. Okay, so that defines uh, then a density function, a time-dependent density function in three dimensions, which is uh, perhaps the, the most natural choice for uh, which kind of density would you associate with a particular weight. You want to ask a question? Shouldn't, shouldn't it be capital M of Q rather than X? Yes, that's right. It should be Q. Um, uh, so uh, you can also express it in terms of the mass density operation. Good. So now you have these two different theories that use the same wave function. They're actually empirically equivalent. That means uh, they make exactly the same predictions. So both deviate from standard quantum mechanics, but they don't deviate from each other. Just yes. In, in your language, uh, what about GRW? It's equivalent to them. You mean without a primitive ontology? Yes. Um, okay, I, I would say that um, that's not a good theory. Because it doesn't contain any primitive ontology, doesn't contain any variables that would represent matter. Good. You're making um, big eyes. I, I, I think many of you uh, um, have the same question. Uh, what on earth do you need this, uh, these additional variables for, this primitive ontology? Okay. So I've anticipated the question, and I've heard some prepared some slides for that. <coughs> Why do you need a primitive ontology? So I will give you several <coughs> several reasons. Why? Why to me a theory a primitive ontology 
makes complete sense, and the theory without a primitive ontology, I have big problems with. Okay, um, I could say that the basic reason is there's a logical gap between saying the psi looks such and such and saying there's a, a certain thing, a live cat, a table, whatever. <coughs> um, why is there um, a logical gap? So, Lev would like to think that this is just the definition of what we mean by that. When, when, when Lev says this, he means that. But, but I don't. Okay, uh, so here's an example. Consider Bohmian mechanics. So unfortunately, I sometimes use Bohmian mechanics and, uh, as, as an example. <coughs> okay, in Bohmian mechanics, it is actually true that, uh, that statement two follows from statement one. Uh, but it just it doesn't just follow by mere logic. It follows by virtue of a law of the theory. And the law is that the configuration, the Bohmian configuration, is actually psi squared. <coughs> uh, what you mean by a cat is a set of particles in Bohmian mechanics, and the, what you mean by the cat being alive is that the configuration looks a certain way, behaves a certain way, and this will be true uh, for the configuration by virtue of this probability distribution uh, if psi is the wave function of a live cat. But you're using this law, and without this law, two, two wouldn't follow from one. And so this astronomically small probability might be wrong. Yes, that's also true. Um, here's another example. Imagine Bohmian particles guided by a GRW wave function. So that's something that you normally don't consider. And uh, there's good reason for not considering that, because it will lead to a catastrophic behavior of the particles. Although the wave function looks reasonable, it's the same wave function as in GRW, it looks good, it looks like wave functions of, uh, of live cats, etc. <coughs> but the particles will behave in a way that, uh, that is um, not at all like the behavior of a live cat. So the point I'm making here is that if you haven't specified the primitive ontology, you don't know what cats do. Because now here are three choices, three possibilities for the primitive ontology. It could be Bohmian particles, it could be flashes, it could be matter density. For matter density and flashes, um, they behave just the right way, like live cats. The Bohmian particles, the GW wave functions, behave horribly. So if you don't know which primitive ontology you're talking about, you don't actually know what conclusions to draw. Here are some further further arguments for primitive ontology. Without a primitive ontology, various paradoxes arise. Here's one example, one such paradox. One might think that GRW theory actually fails to solve the me measurement problem for the following reason. <coughs> Consider such a macroscopic superposition. Psi 1, Psi 2 are two equally large wave packets. C1, C2 are coefficients in front. <coughs> now, if, the, if these two if the two coefficients have equal sides, uh, then we're talking about a Schrodinger cat situation. We've talked uh, about why that is a problem. So let's take for granted there is a problem with that. Now suppose they're not exactly equal. One is 40%, the other is 60%. And there's still a problem, of course. That doesn't make the measurement problem or Schrodinger's cat problem go away. Now, let, let, me, let me decrease one uh, coefficient and increase the other coefficient. Let's say one coefficient um, we make smaller, the other gets closer to one. Now, at which point does the problem disappear? Uh, it wouldn't seem like there's any value where the problem really disappears. It's not clear why, if one coefficient is very small and the other is close to one, why the, um, why the, um, why the problem would have gone away if there was a problem to begin with. Okay, so now I'm heating you up. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So let me give my answer to that. Um, the reasoning misses the primitive ontology. If you think of the primitive ontology, then in GFWM, you have the following situation. You, have, you don't just have the wave function, you also have the m function. The m function is how matter is actually distributed 
in, uh, in space. Good. Now, if one of these coefficients is very small, then uh, its contribution to the n function is negligible, and your n function looks basically <coughs> like a uh, like a light can't. So you have a fact actually in the world, in three-dimensional world, that you have a light can't there. Uh, despite the fact that there is also a small contribution here um, uh, from the wave function of the dead cat. Here's a further variant of this paradox. Let me carry this paradox one step further. Suppose one of the coefficients is near one and the other is small. Now suppose we made a quantum measurement of the macro state, then there is a, a certain small but positive probability of finding psi 2. So if we have this wave function with small psi 2, there is a possibility that if we measure the microstate, we will actually find the, the cat alive, although this is the kind of wave function that occurs in GRW in a situation where we, we usually say, oh, that means that we have a dead cat. Again, uh, the problem disappears if you have a primitive ontology, because then, you would say the statement the cat is dead means that the m function looks and behaves like a dead cat. And that would be actually the case with this kind of wave function. Now, what would happen if you did this measurement, and then suddenly after the measurement, you have a state that is near alive? Then it would follow that the, that the matter density looks like the matter density of a live cat. So after your measurement, you have a live cat. Before the measurement, you have a dead cat. So far, no contradiction. It's just crazy to think that a dead cat could suddenly become alive. So that's a kind of um, uh, a counterintuitive trait of this theory, that in principle, it allows for resurrections, but with tiny probabilities. So that's the no practical issue. You couldn't test your Uh, and here's one final problem um, about uh, one final argument for the for the primitive ontology that has something to do with relativity. So here's space time. So Matthias will talk in, in a lecture um, about relativistic versions of GW theory. Now consider two space-like surfaces, sigma 1 and sigma 2. <coughs> and there are two space-time regions, A and B. And we consider an, uh, a non-locality experiment, Bell experiment, or EPR experiment. There are two particles in the single spin state. They're widely separated in space. <coughs> and the Stangela experiment is carried out on each particle, one in A, one in B, a space-like separation. <coughs> now we consider these two surfaces, one before Bob's experiment and one after Bob's experiment, but both of them before Alice's experiment. Okay, so depending on which surface you consider, the collapse that comes with coupling the one particle to a detector on Bob's side, side uh, will lead to collapse of the wave function. So before, so on sigma one, the wave function of everything together is uncollapsed, and after it is collapsed. So now that has consequences for the reduced density matrix. Consider the reduced spin state of particle A on Alice's side. So before the collapse, the whole spin state is a single state, and its reduced density matrix is a multiple of the identity matrix, of the unit matrix. And afterwards, uh, it, it, the wave function, the total spin state, collapses to either up, down, or down, up, which factorizes the reduced state is a pure state. It's either up or down, depending on what Bob's outcome was. OK, so now you can ask, OK, what is the, um, um, the <coughs> what is the state of affairs on Alice's side just before Alice does her measurement? And the answer is, oh, it depends on whether you look at this surface or that surface, if you only have wave functions. Then the local facts about what happens on Alice's side, that would be represented by the reduced density matrix. 
and that will depend on which surface you look at. Now the idea that local facts here depend on which surface I choose far away, now that seems undesirable, I would say. Um, so that's a problem. But the problem disappears if you have a primitive ontology, because then you have local facts in your primitive ontology. You have flashes here, flashes there. So you don't need local spin states. You have enough facts, local facts, well-defined facts. Um, flashes and what's about density at all? About the density as well. So the density is a function of space-time, or maybe a vector field or a tensor field or something. Doesn't matter much. So you have um, uh, the density function on space-time. So you have a, a clear state of affairs about how your matter is distributed in space-time. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we we discuss it later. And now let's see. I guess this. The time where I should uh, ask for questions. Uh, let's see. Good. Thanks, <laughs>
continuously they have to adjust the uh, finite number of flashes. And so we, uh, mm -hmm. That's important to understand. I think it's real, but okay, at least one has to understand that what the theory says. The continuous matter density has the property that a live repeating, there are no atoms, there are no electrons, there are no, no elementary particles, etc. So when people discovered atoms and electrons and so on, uh, and the, nu the nucleus and so on, they really thought they discovered something localized, which has not, of course, and, you know, which has not a continuous matter density. In fact, before people thought matter could be continuous, and then they found evidence that it's not. But of course, since the evidence is macroscopic, then of course we can always make these theories that will look macroscopically the same as, you know, as the particle, I mean, the atomic theory of matter, which is one of the fundamental. So when you are in high school, you learn, you know, that, you know, matter is made of atoms, and now you have to learn, and that you were wrong before thinking otherwise, and now you have to learn that, in fact, there are no atoms. It seems to me that. To Take the sentence of Einstein that you can say in German, but I, I cannot, that God is, uh, you know, clever but not mischievous, or not mean, or something like that, or, you know, and I think that's an example, and it would be really mean if you made a universe that look like the atoms, but in fact, there are no atoms. Anyway, that's, yeah. that's not a good, that wasn't the question. <laughs> that was the question. Yeah, so, uh, I, I wouldn't argue too much with that. <laughs> yeah, uh, really so my question was, because you mentioned that uh, there's a problem if you're done actual thing to measure that problem. And yeah, when I also think back to my Tia's talk, I mean, as you said, the measured problem is not that there is a microscopic superposition, but that at some point there is no microscopic right? So, I mean, when you look at these two assumptions, the moment, I mean, GRW obviously adds another evolution to the, to the unitary one. So, to me, it seems just by this fact, automatically it's also relevant. Um, okay, so um, you, would, you would think uh, the, the measurement problem has something to do with the fact that uh, um, we know or take for granted that there is a definite outcome, and now in, in, the, in the variables, in the variables that represent something real, in the reality, uh, according to a certain view. Where do we see that outcome? Well, as long as we have this uh, uh, superposition of uh, two uh, microscopic uh, contributions, say of equal size, um, we just don't see this outcome. <clears throat> now, if, if one outcome uh, has uh, a much larger coefficient than the other, then uh, it would seem like, oh yes, I, I see what the actual outcome is. It's the kind of the dominant contribution the one that, that has the large coefficient and not the one with the small coefficient. <clears throat> um, so that's kind of, that's your first thought. And then you think about it more, and then you think, hmm, well, um, that is, I'm actually not so sure. How, how large would it have to be? Now, if you had um, a matter distribution in three dimensions, then this is not such a big problem because this matter distribution, every matter distribution would make sense. And then it's just a matter of kind of, of recognizing that this matter distribution looks like a cat. So that's something that Lev emphasized uh, <coughs> several times that you can uh, that uh, you don't have to have kind of clear cut rules for where one world ends and the next one begins. But if you just have what is actually the reality, then often you can just say, oh, it, it looks like uh, one world is, uh, has a dead cat and the other world has a live cat. And uh, the situation is similar with the, um, um, with the matter distribution. Certain matter distributions just look like live cats. Um, now, um, that is actually, when you think about it, different with these, uh, with these wave packets, um, partly because you normally think of these wave packets as alternative uh, possibilities, alternative
it's just complete mess. You, you left only with one reasonable word. So it's completely solved the measurement problem. You have only one reasonable word. The other one dies, it's just complete. It's, 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 it's a complete, complete mess. It doesn't look like any word. It's not a dead word, mess. not anything, because it's kind of very, it's not, not intuitive. You will think that tail is something flat, but it's really not flat. The tail of the Gaussian, even it's very kind of flat, it's, it's very, very sharp. So when you multiply far away an atom, this atom is immediately excited. So you don't have uh, every uh, GRW kick kills an atom. And uh, so there are relatively many kicks, so this other world is destroyed. So you have only one reasonable picture. Uh, so the, in this sense, GRW solves this without just a wave function. You don't need any, any kind of addition. OK, to me it seems that uh, arguing with uh, what is a reasonable picture or not, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, um, I find it uh, nicer to have the, the, the primitive ontology which solves the problem in a clean way. But somehow I feel like this um, the saying it's a, it's a more reasonable picture doesn't fully convince me. More economic picture, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely more economic. More economic, yes. But I'm not convinced. But you would, 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 would want to worry about this chaos world that, that was created by this collapse. Yeah. I mean, even if it was a small weight, yeah. there would be kind of this, this cat in hell state. Yeah. Yeah, why would you, you worry about that? I'm not a GRW, I don't have to <laughs> worry. But as I think for GRW, it's good. You have only one reasonable world. So it's kind of you saw the. In some situations, GRW doesn't cause a collapse. Like if you have. If, you're, if you read it in kind of not. Yeah, you, not everything caused GRW to collapse. But at least uh, the tail problem is resolved because the other words are not, doesn't look like the normal words. So I think it's, it's a good problem. Yeah, so the, the way I used it was if you have the primitive ontology, then kind of the question of what, what's the status of this, uh, of this, uh, of this cap in hell uh, just disappears. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so collapse is usually defined relative to some operators, some measurements, because we have some basis, and here we solve position basis. Is this generalized to spin and measure basis? Uh, so the question would be, uh, do you want that? Um, I think you don't want that uh, for several reasons. One is uh, you don't want this, this process to be in any way adapted to the kind of measuring device you're, you're setting up. You don't want to have one process, if an observer builds up this device, uh, or another process, if the observer does something else. You want to have one process that is universal, that, uh, that governs the whole universe, governs all particles in the same way. So they keep the position basis. Yes. And so with the position basis, as we saw, it, it works for every measurement. So you, you do your measurement of an arbitrary observable, and in the end, it collapses in just the right way. Even though you did not put into the collapse process the choice of your observable, it just collapses in, in position. Mm -hmm. But as a consequence of that, it will kind of, your single particle wave function will collapse in the right places. Okay. Why is that? For example, then you have an experiment. You split up your uh, your one particle wave function into up and down in, in the direction of your choice. Then you have the, then you have separated it in space. Then you couple it to the detector. Uh, according to GW theory, you, um, um, you collapse in position, and then you have collapsed, let's say, to spin up. Okay. That's how so you couple the spin to Q, right? In position. Okay. And you're doing that anyway in yeah. in this. Uh, so you're doing that like all, all measurements can couple to position. That means. Yes. So, for example, in the end, all the, the measurement results, the, uh, John Bell has a remark like that, in the end, all the measurement results will be represented by positions, say, positions of pointers, or positions of ink on, on paper, or something. Mm -hmm. I think it was there before. Oh, okay, maybe before, before. Felix? Uh, 
So you're, you're saying that the position is just convenient, but in principle you could take something else like the momentum or... Mathematically, perhaps you could. Um, but the housing would be the same. The momentum... Uh, that is a wave function. If the wave function is a Gaussian, but not the collapse is a the collapse function is a Gaussian. But that's not the same thing as saying that if you apply the collapse function to the momentum space. Okay, so mathematically, you could I expect write down equations um, for such a stochastic process that collapses the wave function in momentum space. Now, one question is whether such a theory would lead to correct predictions whether such a theory would actually avoid Schrodinger's cat states, would kind of drive the uh, wave function towards, wave fun uh, towards states that have kind of a, a unique macroscopic appearance. I, I would be skeptical about that. I have, would have doubts about that. Completely not like a zero. Yeah, you're okay. feeling that's it, right? That will have to be momentum we could have to non causal action, right? Because you said that there's the non signaling property. And you might lose it almost automatically if you start doing something in momentum. You I would have to think about you. that. But I would expect uh, that this will not be the main problem. I think the main problem is with the different states of an apparatus, let's say they differ by pointer position. Uh, whether they differ in the momentum representation. You see, they, they're just joined in the position representation because some particles are in a different position then. But uh, you see, when you look at it in the momentum representation, these two pointers, they have, may have all the same momenta. The momenta are maybe all essentially zero. Uh, so maybe these, these two wave packets corresponding to two different outcomes of the experiment then um, are not disjoint in momentum space, maybe they overlap. And that would be, would be bad for this kind of theory. I've got a uh, I have a philosophical question on field selection. I feel like when I compare GRW to the right worlds, like this, um, Mengels maintains unitarity throughout. That, uh, from my understanding, like that notion of comparison of unitarity is lost in GRW. That is right. So isn't that something we should try to maintain like, in a physical theory? But, but like I said, like he favors uh, like a physical theory ought to be deterministic. I, I feel like um, uh, the concept of unitarity shouldn't that be maintained inside physical theory like uh, as an important aspect of what a physical theory ought to be. Um, um, I, I, but that's presumably a matter of taste. Um, I, I think um, I, I understand the feeling, so for, for that reason you might think GRW theory is an ugly theory. Um, uh, at, the, at the same time, you should, you should keep one thing in mind. Uh, in, in the literature um, on how to understand quantum mechanics, there kind of, there's a big divide. There are kind of two big camps. Uh, one class of suggestions uh, basically says, basically gives up on having a single coherent picture. That's like Copenhagen, uh, decoherent histories. And the other class says, oh, what we want to have is a single coherent picture that can explain the entire world, a single theory that explains everything. And in this class, you have uh, Bohm, GRW, many worlds. <coughs> and that is kind of the, the big difference, okay, the big divide. And uh, so, um, in a certain in a certain sense, GRW and many worlds and Bohmian mechanics they're closer to each other. They're, they're kind of relatively close to each other because you have to compare it to Copenhagen or different histories, uh, um, the kind of theories that uh, reject the desire for a single picture. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with the, with the divide. I would just comment that maybe you could also phrase it that the divide is about theories that say quantum physics is about the world, and the other type of theory says quantum is the wave function is about the, the, the perspective of your observer. You call this incoherent picture, but I mean, as we also discussed, I think these are also can be consistent theories. So I, I, I would say, that in 
other words, you could say this divide between theories is theories that say wave functions about the work of a property of the work or wave functions of property of the one using the wave function. Yes. Okay. And more so, uh, yes. so if, if this interpretation is as perfect as it seems, uh, how come it's not more famous? How, how come it's not taught yet in, in at school, for example? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, that's, uh, it's not perfect. It achieves its goal. It actually provides uh, a theory of, uh, of quantum mechanics. And I mean, uh, keep in mind that it was long believed that that is impossible to have any theory of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. So, but not perfect, yeah, you could say it's a kind of. Uh, um, it's uh, mm -hmm. contrived, it's artificial, it's, it's ugly. Uh, yes, uh, maybe it is. But uh, it, it achieves something that, um, that Copenhagen did not achieve. So I think, uh, um, yes, why actually uh, doesn't it receive uh, attention? Or uh, the, the attention that you might have expected for doing some solving uh, uh, kind of the most basic problem of quantum mechanics. Um, I'm not sure whether there's a uh, whether th there's a simple answer to that. So that, that, is, that is a matter of sociology. Can I give an answer to that? Can I give an answer? Uh, yeah, I don't know who was first. Mm -hmm. uh, just well, a comment, which you know, it's a John Bell Institute, and I think that the fact that GRW got it atten uh, some attention. It's just accident because for once uh, John Bell uh, looked on this theory and adopted it and pushed it up. It just, if would, this would not happen, no one would hear about this theory at all. Without John Bell, it would have received even less attention than like, the like by factor of uh, big factor. John. Well, I think the answer to tomorrow I would present a theory which I think is more perfect than the other than you, it is Bohm's theory. But then, you see, it does doesn't go as much attention as it should, and the reason is simple. The reason is simply that we just don't care. And that's tragic, but that's the point. The physicists don't care about what their theory means. If you go, I don't know, you're, presumably you are, but you are a physics student, I don't know what happens if you go to your professor and say, what does it mean? Okay? I tried that when I was a student, and one professor replied, he was a Swiss German with a very strong accent, he said, Bohm explained everything. Refuse to say how first. But uh, I mean, uh, that's all you, the sort of answer you get. So uh, I don't know. Well, one thing I was learning is that physics doesn't speak about the world, but about that, but of our knowledge of it. It really doesn't make any sense if you think about it. So you get all this, and uh, this is the best you get because many times it's shut up and calculate, you don't care, you don't ask questions. Which is a general you know, mindset, which is terrible, but that is it is. And I think that's the reason. It's not that they have looked at the theory and said it's ugly, so I don't care. That's not. That's maybe my point of view, but that's my point of view. So sad. Huh? It's so sad. Yeah, if you have the younger generation, you can change the situation. <laughs> okay, one last question, perhaps. Uh, so I gather from your from your talk that you are not a fan of uh, theories without a primitive ontology. So, you can say so. What is your take on the many birth theory? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so how much time do we have? <laughs> One hour. I, I take half the half the time too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think. Th that's a problem for many worlds, but the, the problem can be solved. It has been solved. So there are different versions of many worlds. One is due to Everett. That is what we have presented. Uh, the idea is that all is psi, or psi is all. That was the slogan. So <coughs> uh, now there is a different many worlds theory that's due to Schrödinger, in which there is a primitive ontology. Uh, and in fact, what Schrödinger did was um, he, he took this equation for, for the mass density, the measure density that I had on this slide. You take the very same equation, 
Now you apply it to a wave function that evolves according to the Schrödinger equation. So no collapse. Uh, that is like you take GRW theory and set lambda equal to zero. Okay, so <coughs> in, in Schrodinger's theory, you have a wave function uh, that evolves uh, according to the Schrodinger equation, and then you form this matter density. You have matter that is continuously distributed with its density, so you take a psi squared density and you take a three-dimensional marginal. Now, if psi is a wave function of Schrodinger's cat, then uh, it has two wave packets, one corresponding to line, the, the other to a dead cat. Um, now, if you take the three-dimensional marginal of that, you will have the, the, the matter distribution of a live cat plus the matter distribution of a dead cat. And then as time evolves, what happens is that the live cat walks around and doesn't seem to notice the dead cat. It will pass through the dead cat because there is no interaction between particles that belong to the live cat. And and particles. No particles, no particles. Ah, in the, uh, the yeah, in, in the wave function, I should say. Yeah, because they're, they're kind of destroying wave packets. Um, and since there, there's no interaction between particles and the wave function uh, corresponding to the live cat and those corresponding to the dead cat because they're destroying wave packets. Uh, then on, on the level of this mass density function, you don't see any interaction. They can pass through each other. They don't interact. They don't notice each other. Yeah, that's, but uh, but yeah you, you should like that. You but I have comment. Yeah, yeah. Okay. more or less to okay. exist because I think there is no difference whatsoever, whatsoever. I don't think the mass density is not a new theory. It's just this, you add some interpretation with some work primitive topology. A part of this is exactly this. This thing. So it's now not mass density, just put some equation. You can cut. This is uh, flashes, it's a different additional kind of ontology. This is not ontology, this is your just interpretation. I okay. have exactly the same. I maybe not could multiply it by mass, but it doesn't really matter. So you have branches with mass or not mass, the numbers, because uh, it's, but it's exactly the same story. No. Average with uh, this wave function has the same picture. I have to I have to have a picture of a table and a cat. This is my picture. This is uh, in, in exactly this uh, this integral. Exactly this picture. Okay. So the the way I understand Schrödinger's theory, or the the way I'm using Schrödinger's theory, is uh, as a theory in which the the ontology is actually different from the one in Edward. Uh, okay. Let me try to explain the difference by means of a creation method. Okay. Um, God says, I want to create another universe, and this time it will be a many worlds universe. <clears throat> and he says, I will do it according to Everett. Then on day one, he creates the wave function of the universe, makes it evolve unitarity. And that's, he's done. There's just one day of creation. Now according to Schrodinger, he needs two days. Day one, he creates the wave function of the universe, makes it evolve unitarily. Day two, he creates matter in three-dimensional space and makes it move according to this formula. Two days. So, uh, kind of that's a, um, perhaps a silly way, a way of illustrating um, the difference between the two things. It's a difference in ontology. It's a difference whether you claim that there is actually some matter there that follows a certain law of motion. Now. Uh, um, for me, the, uh, the version, Schrodinger's version, makes more sense than Everett's version. Uh, so I would say yes, there's a uh, there's a problem with Everett's version, and it has been solved by Schrodinger. And if there are no more problems, no more questions, I'm sure there are more problems. <laughs> <laughs> more